Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me Podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to the All Me Podcast. My name is Tavis Biotoli, sports dietitian for the Taylor Hooten Foundation, and today I'm going to be your host. There are more than 7 billion clinical lab tests performed in the U.S. each year. Some of these tests are part of a routine checkup for individuals, while others dive much deeper into evaluating someone's health. Athletes are no different in that many collegiate, professional, and Olympic athletes have specific blood panels drawn and evaluated before they start their respective seasons. But what is the significance around this? And can the results of an athlete's blood work have any impact on performance markers? In this podcast, we speak with sports dietitian Jennifer Gibson, who has worked with Olympic and professional athletes about specific markers that are a critical part of the assessment process of her job. We discuss which markers are most commonly deficient or elevated in athletes, along with blood work that can influence an athlete's recovery, strength, and level of inflammation. Furthermore, we dive into common nutrient deficiencies that she has seen on a regular basis, along with strategies to correct them. But don't miss out on the ending where she finally names the band she would like to front, which I've seen close to 15 times live. We'd also like to thank our partners at Gatorade for sponsoring this podcast. Jen, thank you so much for joining us today on the All Me Podcast. It's so good to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. So we're going to talk about biomarker testing for athletes. And before we do, before we get into like the, you know, the scientific stuff and all the fun stuff about learning about what this is, let's talk a little bit about you because you and I kind of have similar career paths. And I love the fact that you've spent, you know, a lot of time in different places, the Olympics, the NFL. And it's so let's let's really tell our listeners about your career path as a dietitian. What really made you want to pursue this type of career? Well, for me, it was kind of like trying to find a career where I could just blend the things that I loved growing up. And I grew up in an Italian family and, uh, you know, my grandparents are actually from Italy. And so I say that because food was like our, our, our lifeblood. Like I grew up with food being a really, really central part of our life for everything. So I loved food. And then I was a total science geek in, in school loved biology. And then I was also an athlete. So having a career as a sport dietitian just seemed like the ideal blend of like my love for science, my love for food and my love for sport. And so that's kind of how it all got rolling. Um, I'm originally, I'm originally from Canada. So, um, that's kind of where it all started for me. Okay, cool. I'm just curious because I'm Italian too. So what part of Italy was your family from? So my, my two grandparents are from their two little regions that are just South of Rome. Um, kind of in the Lazio region. My grandmother's from a, a, t- a town called Frosinone, and my grandfather is from a tiny little village of 500 people called Sette Frati. And okay. so I actually speak Italian and, and I love going back to Italy because I get to like get back in the mode of, of my, my cultural roots. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, man, my part of the roots are Catania. So in that whole Sicily region, ah. part of the family's from. I've never been, so I'm looking forward to going one day. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get into today's topic, biomarker testing for First, what is a biomarker test? Because some people might be listening going, what's a biomarker? So can you kind of give a pretty simple explanation of what that means? Sure, sure. So biomarker testing is kind of like this broad term that basically means um, some sort of um, kind of biological test that you would do. It could be a salivary test. It could be a blood test. um, It could be a urinary test. But basically what they are is they provide an objective and kind of quantitative assessment of your athlete's um, nutrition status or training status or some sort of health status of your athlete. So basically it's kind of a broad term that, that outlines a, um, a test of your athlete's biology and how you can interpret it relative to what they're doing. Awesome. As we look at analyzing these types of samples and blood markers, why is it so important to analyze blood work in athletes before the start of the season? So it's, it's critical really to, to, to at least analyze your, your athlete's blood work at the, before the start of the season, because that's going to give you your baseline of the athlete. And so, um, having a a baseline assessment before the training, the heavy training kicks off, gives you a sense of what their health status and their nutritional status is at rest. 
um, before the strain of that physiology begins. So that a really, that's a really critical time to have your initial blood work for the athlete to kind of see where they are in that kind of, um, rested state. Um, so that when you do serial testing over time throughout the season, you can kind of analyze the impact of the training volume on, on the athlete's physiology. Now, our listeners are probably going, there's so many, so many different types of tests that they may have had, you know, in their own little just assessment of daily health with all the variety of types of blood work that can be analyzed. When you look at those tests, what are some of the most important ones that you and your medical team were looking at for baseline for the athlete? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like, it's funny. I should have it like tattooed on my arm because this is like <laughs> the standard that we always talk about, you know, it's like, what should we get? Okay. This is what we get. And so this is kind of the, 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 every place I've worked in my whole career. Um, this is kind of what we always get. And it's, um, a complete blood count, which is going to give you kind of all the markers of, of immune health, um, and, and blood cell health, a complete metabolic profile, which is going to give you a bunch of markers, related to, um, different organ systems in the body. So kidneys, um, liver, um, things like that. Um, a vitamin D an omega three index, an iron panel, which is a, a series of different tests for iron status, including a serum ferritin. Um, depending on the, on the, on the type of athlete, we'll usually do a lipid panel, which is going to be looking at, um, you know, obviously the, the, the lipid status and cardiovascular health of the athlete, um, B12, um, and, and a urinalysis. And then in the last few years, adding a red blood cell magnesium is, is a new marker that we've started to add to look at magnesium status in our athletes. Awesome. That's interesting. Now, as a sports dietitian, right, your, your focus is to help these athletes fuel, understand how to hydrate. And a lot of people might not think, well, why is a sports dietitian looking at blood work? Because we want to look at certain nutritional biomarkers, right? And and when you're looking at those nutritional biomarkers to assess nutrition status, we know it's important, but you mentioned a few things like iron, vitamin D, magnesium, omega-3. Are, do you find those are the most critical nutrients that you're looking at, or are there others that you also want to kind of explore as well? That's a really great question. So those are kind of my, my key nutrition biomarkers that I feel comfortable testing across all populations. So my omega-3 index, my vitamin D, my iron status. My, my RBC magnesium and maybe B12 and folate would be ones that I would do standardized testing on. Um, and then it just depends on the individual athlete. If they have anything else that's kind of coming down the pipe that kind of may indicate that we would need to go into some deeper, maybe individual, you know, nutrient, nutrient testing. And it really just depends on a case by case basis. If those things make sense to do, let's say you have an athlete that has kind of a really low energy availability situation, um, then you might kind of add some additional markers looking at, you know, some more additional, additional nutrition markers, for example, to that athlete's panel. Um, but in general, if you kind of do the broad spectrum that I, that I mentioned, plus those individual nutrition markers, you'll get a good overall sense of where the athlete's at. Um, and then it's kind of a case by case basis to see if there's anything else that you'd want to kind of go deeper in. Now, we know some athletes might have some deficiencies, especially, and you've worked at both the Olympic and the professional space. So are there specific biomarkers that you find are more prevalent to being deficient in in athletes today? Yeah, 100%. Um, Vitamin D, as we know, has been something that a ton of athletes um, can be deficient in, especially I've worked not not like you, Tavis. I've been up north for a long time. So um, especially in in the northern latitudes where we don't get sun for like half the year. Um, you know, and so, um, that can be, um, that, that marker is generally, um, something we are concerned about. Even if you're working with winter sport athletes, they're chasing winter. They're literally chasing winter all year round. So in in the summer months for us, they're down in Argentina and, um, you know, down South chasing winter down there in opposite seasons. So winter sport athletes, of course, that would be something that they'd be often deficient in. The other one is the omega-3 index. So a lot of our athletes, a lot of our young athletes are not um, eating a lot of omega-3 rich foods. They maybe don't have access to things like fatty fish um, because of budget restraints or maybe just where they're being fed. They may not be, that may not be on offer um, or they may just not have a habitual intake of high omega-3s. So when I was testing omega-3s with NFL players, for example, we had at least 50% of the team that didn't have optimal omega-3 status. And then um, RBC magnesium um, is is something that is tied to vitamin D because we know that 
Oftentimes if someone's vitamin D deficient, they'll also be magnesium deficient because the two are kind of correlated in the body with that type of metabolism. So that tends to follow trend. If I have a vitamin D deficient athlete, then the, then the RBC magnesium is usually also low. So those would be the, the three that I often see. If you're dealing with an endurance population where they're just chewing through oxygen and, and their blood the red blood cell, you know, systems are getting taxed because of that, then we would often then start to see iron, iron issues with either iron depletion or iron deficiency. Um, but that's a, a little bit more related to a higher kind of aerobic, um, type sport, but that would be something when, you know, when I was working with that population, we'd see all the time as well. Dietitians and, um, medical doctors, they're testing, obviously, I think some of the colleagues we've talked to is there's a lot of routine things that everyone tests for, but Let's talk. You're, I think you think out of outside of the box a little bit more than some of the other colleagues in, in, in the fact that you're testing for things that might not be commonly tested. Are there any nutrients that you find, hey, I'm t- I need a test for this, but it's not the norm. We don't see a lot of people testing for it. What would that be? Is there, are there any markers that, that you want to explore? And you may have mentioned those already, but anything out of the box? Yeah. So something that we've toyed a lot, a lot with over the years, just thinking outside the box and especially with COVID come COVID, um, recently was, um, testing for, you know, zinc status. Mm. And, um, that's something that is still kind of a little bit elusive with trying to find, you can test serum zinc. Um, and, but it's just not that reliable yet. Just like with magnesium, you can, you can test magnesium, but um, that specific test, serum magnesium, kind of just, it, it can be very um, affected by training volume and things like that. And so that's why when we test magnesium, we go to red blood cell magnesium because that specific test looks at more of the magnesium stored at the cellular level. So that, that test becomes more um, reliable. So this is, it's the, the same story with zinc. We can't really, we haven't found really a good reliable uh, zinc marker. Um, yet. And I know that's something that's being kind of worked on behind the scenes, but that's, um, that's a, a tiny trace mineral that it, that's always been of interest to me, um, because of its role in immune health. And we know that, that obviously with COVID that became something where there, there was actually, you know, zinc, um, supplementation protocols going out for COVID to help boost the immune system. But in, a, in addition to that kind of immune system health for, for sickness, we know that our athletes are, especially at high training volumes, can be susceptible to, um, you know, immunosuppression, especially in the, in the few hours acutely post-exercise, but with chronic exercise loads, their immune systems are compromised. And so we can kind of look a little bit at some of the uh, traditional immune markers, but I've always been curious about zinc um, testing and kind of if there was a way to develop, um, specific supplementation protocols for that, um, around some good markers. So that's probably the one that's always been on my mind over the years. Awesome. No, that's interesting. Cause we don't, like you mentioned, we don't really hear about let's test for zinc status and relationship with COVID T cell development. That's, that's excellent. Let's, yeah. Oh. In Europe, there's, there's a little bit more in, in, in especially in, in the UK, they had been doing some trace mineral testing projects over the last few years, but specifically in our community in, in, in the States, we aren't looking at those trace minerals as much as maybe some of the, some of our global, um, um, practitioners have been. Excellent. Now let's, let's kind of dive into gender, gender a little bit. How does gender or the athlete's gender play a role in the types of biomarkers that you request? Are there any biomarkers that you want to see in female athletes that you may not request in males and vice versa? Yeah. So, I mean, very generally speaking, if I'm dealing with kind of an overall, like blanket statement, you know, um, if I'm dealing with, let's say a sport population where it's like a team sport, like let's say I'm dealing with like volleyball, for example, where it's not like a super aerobic sport. Um, and I'm looking at a male versus female panel, um, the male panels, if I'm just doing a generic, uh, request, I probably wouldn't ask for an iron panel, maybe in that, gen- in that male population. Cause generally speaking, they're not chewing through, um, as much oxygen. It's not a super aerobic sport. Whereas I might request request that iron panel to be mandatory in my female volleyball players, because we know that they have a menstrual cycle and that blood loss could maybe contribute to some iron deficiency. That would be a specific example of male versus female, maybe for when I want to order an iron panel. Um, if I'm, if I'm dealing with budget and I got to kind of pick and choose. Um, and then obviously if, if you're permitted, because because it really widely varies across sport and what what's allowed to be tested. If you're if where you are permits you to to test hormones, 
um, then obviously those, those two panels can be vastly different, um, in terms of what you test in a female athlete for her, um, for her specific female reproductive hormones. And then obviously if you were to be testing, you know, testosterone or, or male sex hormones in, in, in the, in the male athlete, and you're permitted to do that, then obviously those would be a different panel, um, altogether. Um, but those would be kind of those blanket, um, if I was to do like a, a general script for a team, um, the ideal way to really do those types of markers is, is on an individual basis where you kind of have a story and a rationale for why you'd want to test those things. Excellent. No, that's a great explanation. Appreciate that. Now, I want to discuss now specific biomarkers that may have a direct impact on performance markers. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to name the outcome. And can you give our listeners some of the biomarkers that you might test for that may impact the outcome? especially if that person is deficient. So my yep. first outcome is, let's say I want to improve strength. Is there anything we can test for to determine that might be impacting that athlete's strength? Sure. What I want to just take a step back and before we get into each of these, which is it's a really fascinating way to think about it, um, is that we have to also remind ourselves as practitioners that, that biomarkers are just part of the story, right? So the biomarkers are telling me the, oh, it's helping, help me have some objective data of the overall story of the athlete. So when we look at these specific instances, sometimes coaches will kind of hone in and say, well, what does the blood work say for strength? And then, and then like we hang it all on strength, right? On the blood work, but it has to be also part of like the overall a, a dietary assessment, which includes your dietary evaluation, your anthropometry and body comp, your clinical exam and patient history. This is part of the, the circle of information that we're gathering if we're having an issue with strength. But if we are having an issue with strength, as you're mentioning, so a coach comes up and we're, we're noticing decrements in strength and they're kind of unexplained. Um, then in terms of measuring something like that, we would go through that full routine testing that I, that I talked to before, because could this you start to go into these thoughts. Is it, is it an overtraining situation? Is the body overly taxed? So having those markers of your, your organ systems, your CMP, your CBCs, that's going to give you some sense there. Cause there's also some inflammatory markers that come with those panels. But then obviously if it's, um, if it's a male athlete, you may want to throw in, um, your testosterone, uh, measurements, if you're permitted to do that. And you might also want to throw in like a thyroid test, for example, to see if that's, if that's impacting things. Cause, cause usually if there's a decrement in strength there at a phys- if it's a physiological, um, reason, it's usually in that realm of maybe overtraining and, and something's going on, or maybe there's some sort of underlying illness situation that a doctor would, would step in on. You make a fantastic point. And I love how you said, let's take a step back and look at other things because let's say all the blood work comes back. Great. The athlete's not getting any stronger. They might be even getting weak and they're fatigued. And then you realize there are a thousand calories in a deficit every day. Yes. So, so that's a great point. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. All right. You, you address strength. What about endurance? athletes? Yeah. So endurance athletes, usually when we're, when we're kind of trying to understand what's going on with them, we're going to start to get deeper and deeper into kind of iron panel testing. And so you can kind of do some basic, you know, iron testing where you just look at your, you know, overall hemoglobin and things like that. But in those situations, you probably want to do, um, a little bit more of a, uh, desirable iron test. So in addition to maybe your serum ferritin, hemoglobin concentration and transfer and saturation, you might want to add additional ones. There's, there's this great marker called serum soluble transferrin receptor, which is kind of a funny name, but that's a really, really desirable um, iron test. It's very specific to telling you about their status. Um, hemoglobin mass is another really nice one to track. And then you can t- pair that all with C-reactive protein that kind of helps to tell you a little bit about that whole system in the body. So if I'm dealing with an endurance athlete, um, and endurance issues, it would probably be a really robust iron panel. And then a very, um, and then you probably would have some, some supplementation, um, interventions there, but then you really want to kind of track that over time and, and make sure you're serially mark, uh, measuring that athlete to see if you do find something in the blood work related to their, their blood cell volume or their iron status that, that that's improving. Excellent. What about inflammation? anything to to assess there? Yeah. So it's kind of a really big word. Inflammation is, is just this big word that means so many things, (laughs) um, these days. And, and what I like to, and, and it's, it's something that a lot of coaches get fixated on as well. And, and so I think what we always need to remind 
the athlete and the coach, because this word, this word has been tossed around so much is that the inflammatory response is a normal, good response that our body has to training. And it, you know, I always say to my guys like, okay, you, you train and then your body is like, what are you doing? Like your body freaks out because, you know, mashing it up the way you do is not normal. And so your body therefore says, what are you doing to me? And there's an inflammatory response that helps to signal a bunch of repair and restorative, you know, pathways in the body to get your, to get you back to homeostasis. So a lot of times people worry about inflammation and I always say, okay, yes, there, there's definitely times where you can be in, a, in an over inflammatory state, but the general inflammatory process is a good, healthy thing that our body does post training. And it helps to get, to kind of get us back to normal and back maybe 10 years ago, there was a, a whole push for us to, to, to add all these anti-inflammatory AC and it was called ACE supplementation, AC and E. We were pounding all these anti-inflammatory supplements at high doses to try to attenuate that inflammatory response. And what the research found was actually that we were doing, it was decremental and, and athletes weren't recovering properly because we were inhibiting that inflammatory response. So I'm just going into that whole thing. Cause I, I, I always find it fascinating talking about inflammation because it's actually a good thing, but chronic infl inflammation where, you know, the athletes are chronically, I guess, dealing with, um, just ongoing stress of exercise. Um, that would be kind of your, your, you know, your, your, your CBC panel has some inflammatory markers in there. You have your IL six and some, a lot of interleukins and then, um, um, creatine kinase can be a helpful marker to test for inflammation. Um, but it's a very transient marker. So what I mean, what I mean by that is that it kind of can go up and down depending on training volume. So if you are going to choose to, to, to do inflammation tracking with like creatine kinase or, um, some of your CBCs, or even something like cortisol, which is a stress hormone, you have to really make sure you're testing frequently and you're testing kind of at the same time every day. So you can get kind of a, I call it your, your, your hormone or your inflammation kinetics. Cause a lot of times they could just be high from training. And then you're going to kind of look for outliers outside of that, but you really have to understand the body, the individual athletes kind of physiology. If you're going to track inflammatory markers, just because inflammation is just such a normal thing that, 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 that happens post-training. And so um, if you just see one measure and it's really high, that may mean nothing in the grand scheme of things. If you don't understand how that body reacts to inflammation. Sorry, Absolutely. that was a really long chat no, about that. It was great. <laughs> no, it's it, like you said, it's a big word. There's so many parts. It's like recovery. When someone says, what can I do to recover? I'm like, well, how much time do you have? Because there's five or six mm -hmm. different parts to recovery. So it's, it's good. Yeah. Right, last one we'll talk about is immunity, immune health, anything that you can look for in, in the blood work that really can say, all right, these are some things that could be affecting your immune system. Yeah. And so I'll go back, I'll go back to that, like, you know, that, that basic CBC, um, that's complete blood count. That's going to give you, um, all of your markers of your, um, your, your immune system markers, which is going to be, you know, your white blood cells, um, and kind of all of the little cell kind of clusters that take care of, um, your immune system health. So all your neutrophils, I always call them your fills, your fills and your sites, you know, your monocytes, <laughs> your inosophils, your basophils, your lymphocytes, your neutrophils, your white blood cells, the, all those little guys that when we, when we get sick or our immune system is compromised, just start to elevate because they're, they're heading off to attack whatever's there. Um, and so those are very sensitive to that, to, to invasion, so to speak. Um, and so those, those are beautiful markers to have a look at. And, um, and, and when we used to serially test our athletes at the Olympic training center, you would, it would like, you know, it was pretty much one for one sometimes with those when, when they would be elevated and either the athlete was going to be getting sick in the next couple of days or was already experiencing some sort of, um, you know, respiratory infection or something like that. So they're very reliable markers for that. Excellent. So I know as sports dietitians, we, we really focus a lot on the deficiency side, especially if someone's deficient of maybe like you mentioned, vitamin D, magnesium, omega-3, et cetera. But Let's look at the other side of things. Are there any biomarkers, if they're really elevated, that really concern you that say this athlete might be sick or something may be going on with their health? Yeah. Um, it's funny when I think back on, on many experiences I've had um, over the years. Yeah, there absolutely is. And um, one of the things and it's things I've experienced is um, the so in your complete blood and sorry, in your complete metabolic profile, one of the um, areas you test for is your liver health and um, liver enzymes. 
And so, um, that's a really important one to look at. And, and a lot of times, you know, dietitians may not even look at them or have access to them, but they're, you know, your basic, you know, your Billy Rubens and your AST and your ALT liver markers. And, um, and so those, when they're elevated means that something's going on with the liver and, um, it's no mystery to anyone that works with athletes that, you know, alcohol <laughs> intake, um, can be something that, uh, is something that happens quite often and maybe can be a start to get into an abusive situation or just an over overkill situation. And we also know, and this is your areas of expertise, Tavis is, you know, supplement supplements, taking too many supplements, or maybe getting into the, um, anabolic steroid realm. All of that is processed through our liver. So a lot of times elevated liver enzymes, um, can be an indication of either any of those things are going on at a level that's maybe unsafe. And so that's definitely one area that I've reg regularly seen elevated markers with that, that I work with our physician, um, to kind of discover what's going on with the athlete. Um, and they can, it can have an impact on their long-term health if, if their liver enzymes are higher and they're experiencing liver damage. But that's something that, especially in the athletic population, I've found can sometimes, um, with the further clinical assessment can sometimes indicate some, some bad health practices going on. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned that and it could be medication related. Like yes. you know, somebody might say, I don't even drink. And all of a sudden my liver enzymes are elevated. And then we, like you said, you got to dive into supplement use. Maybe they're taking certain prescription meds like Tylenol or I see yes. thing that could be driving that liver up. Excellent. Yes. Now I know as part of, as a, as a sports dietitian, you work as a team. How close did you work with your sports med and medical team to really determine the course of an action when, you know, if you look at some, some of those biomarkers or when assessing blood work? Yeah. And it's, 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 it's an interesting question because for all the different places I've worked over the years and I've worked within the Canadian Olympic system, I've worked at the U S Olympic training center. I've worked in pro tennis, MLS. I'm like you, Tavis everywhere. Um, and then the NFL, every specific team and kind of system you work in has a different way that they go about this type of testing. And so I've been in situations where our teams don't even have access to it. You're like literally zero. Um, and then you have situations where the, the, there's one prescribing physician that you barely know, and you kind of have to fight for even access to look at what they're ordering, let alone have impact. Um, and then I had a really lovely situation at the U S Olympic training center where, um, and actually in the women's pro tennis tour, where the, where the RD could actually request specific panels, we didn't order them because we don't have ordering, ordering authority because uh, we're not physicians, but we could actually go to the, to, to the medical doctor and say, listen, I would like to, to I would like to order these um, pan this panel for this athlete. I think this is important for them. And I think I'd like to see these markers. And then this diet that with the physician's sign off, we were able to order them and obviously communicate results back with the physician because it's under their directive. But we had a lot of say in what we wanted to look at for the athlete, um, which was fantastic. And then most recently when I was at the bears, I had a fantastic relationship with our, with our head, um, head of medical and our head doctor. And he was great. And we kind of sat down year every year and, and, and took a look at what we were looking at. And I kind of had proposals put forth with research evidence as to why I wanted to maybe add a few markers. And, um, again, he was fantastic in kind of, um, having the relationship where we could add markers and, um, and then again, communicate back and forth regarding, you know, way, way, way forward plans for the athletes. So, um, it's, it's a really good thing when you can have a great relationship with sport med, because what I will say is that a lot of our sport med docs are not generally, um, completely well-versed with the nutrition markers because they're looking at, at the health markers, which is great. And so if you can kind of have a nice relationship with your referring physician where you can kind of educate them and they respect your knowledge as well. And, and you can kind of educate each other in that, in those areas, it really makes life a lot easier and, and it can really help your athletes out. Yeah. You would think as working as a team, we can get better outcomes, but you know, sometimes there's just old school practitioners in, in all, all walks of life that are just, they're still set in their ways and they, they sometimes might feel threatened, right? It's like, it's, it's a difficult thing to, to get across when you're trying to help the athlete at the end of the day. Yeah. And there are some, in, in, in there are some great testing kits. Like for example, I use Omega quant a lot, which is a, um, you don't need a physician's referral for it. It's a, it's a dried blood spot testing tool where you just kind of need a few drops of blood. And, um, if you have access to, um, a waiver, you know, or, or, a 
a proper waiver for your athlete to sign off, um, for them to, to kind of do those types of tests. Um, that's a situation where you can kind of look at things like your omega-3 index and your vitamin D, um, pretty easily, just kind of on your own, um, using some of these, um, validated kind of testing technique techniques as well. So there, and I'm not saying you have to bypass a doctor, but if you don't have access to a sport med physician, there's, there's other ways for you to also get some of this data. Excellent. So just a couple more questions. Um, you've mentioned vitamin D and omega-3 deficiencies, you know, especially being common. What's the best course of action when it comes to changing nutritional deficiencies? Do you focus on food first? Is it supplements? Is it a combination? What, what have you found, what have you found as being kind of like the best course of action? Yeah, that's a really great question because there's, every time I talk to some young, young practitioners, they're always like, what's the protocol? What's your protocol? And they want to kind of have the protocol. And, um, <laughs> the best protocol is consistency. That's actually the number one protocol consistency. What, what, what do you want to prescribe to your athlete that they're actually going to be consistent at doing? And so that's the key. That's the actual protocol. What are they going to consistently do to, to change this? So for, for vitamin D, for example, you can actually, um, you can change your vitamin D level, um, to, a if you're deficient to a, to a better state, to a normal state in many, many different ways. So there's, um, you can actually just do sunlight exposure, you know, um, controlled sunlight exposure with maybe a low dose supplement, or, you know, if you like cod liver oil, go for it. Um, and, and kind of having controlled sun exposure for maybe 20 minutes a day, like half your body, and then a low dose through food or a small supplement, um, after four to eight weeks, the research shows you can correct your vitamin D status, but that takes some time and some dedicated, you know, consistency to that. So in some cases they may go to a high dose under medical supervision, high dose once a week, um, supplementation protocol with vitamin D and get to the same place. And it's easier for the athlete because they take one dose once a week and that's it. So that's an example of where with vitamin D, you can kind of get to it different ways. The same thing with correcting an omega-3, um, deficiency, um, uh, it's, it's, again, it's, it's kind of understanding your athlete and what they're going to be most compliant with. So are they going to be most compliant with taking some omega-3 supplementation, um, that's NSF certified if you're dealing with drug tested athletes, um, or is it something where they just kind of were unaware of the foods that contain omega-3s and they're willing to kind of go through dietary measures to kind of get there or a combination of both. So, um, the, the correct answer to that is what <laughs> pick, pick your poison, but, but make it towards the athlete that, and their habitual kind of routines and how, you know, that they're going to go and their environment. So I'm not going to tell an athlete that doesn't have access to, to fatty fish or, or nuts because they're expensive. I'm not going to tell them to go eat that. Right. We might, we might end up, um, going through a different means to get that, that done, you know? So it's, it's a great question. And I think that for an RD, that's where you're the art of being an RD comes in and, and kind of getting that behavior change that this consistent with what the athlete can actually do consistently. Now, frequency of testing. How often did you test your athletes to ensure they're kind of staying within normal range, especially any if any of those had deficiencies? And does it depend, I guess, on the type of test? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in an ideal world, um, so in an ideal, and I kind of use the Olympic world as kind of the, the, the standard for this stuff because I feel like it's a lot more generally, um, serial blood testing is a lot more of a normal thing, I think, in the Olympic world. Ideally, you'd love, you'd love to do it monthly. You know, I know some professional teams, especially in Europe, um, that do biomarker testing. They use salivary testing kits and they do it weekly. Some of them do it daily. Guys are spitting into tubes and they're kind of analyzing, um, some of those inflammatory markers that we talked about. So, but at the same time, it has to kind of make sense for what you're trying to achieve. Right. And, and what your staffing is like and what your budget is like. It, it's kind of a, it depends. Um, I, I think more is better, but then it also has to depend and make sense for like, you know, again, what, what the training cycle is like. So if I was looking at a football athlete, I would look at, okay, when would be the ideal time to test? I'd say definitely your preseason, um, your preseason marker, you probably want to test, um, right before training camp. Cause they've had a kind of a time off period then, 
um, post training camp, because that's the highest volume that they generally tend to, um, experience in the season. And then you're probably looking at maybe a mid season, mid to late season testing. Cause usually that's when their vitamin D deficiencies might start to pop up a little bit more. And then if you're very lucky enough to get a postseason test, just to kind of see the results of what happened of the whole season, that would be nice. But I say ideally monthly, that would be my ideal world, but, um, it really, really depends on, on the sport you're with and the budget and the situation you're in. Awesome. Last question, Jen, is there anything else you'd like our readers? So I say readers, our listeners, <laughs> oh, I call you guys readers, but maybe you are reading some of this that we haven't really discussed today. anything of importance. Yeah, I think, I think what's um, been most interesting to me, cause I've been looking at blood panels for, you know, 15 to 17 years in my practice. And, um, I think what's been very interesting is just in the last, like five, probably like seven to eight years, there's been this explosion of athlete blood work panels being offered by companies. Um, and, and, and they kind of offer these, uh, robust, um, panels that are very expensive. You know, sometimes they're, you know, five to $10,000 per, uh, athlete. Um, and, uh, they, the results come back and they're, um, in these beautiful binders and, and a lot of explanations and it's very, very well done, very professional, um, and, and, you know, very insightful information in there. But what I want to just say is that that's great. And there's a huge business going on out there marketing these, these specific athlete panels to, um, our athletes. And what I will say is that, um, when you start to look into them, they're just the same blood biomarkers that I just described that your referring physician can just tick off on a box and maybe the results don't look as fancy when they come back from the lab. <laughs> but the most important thing is that, that they're interpreted correctly. And so, you know, there's just, um, sometimes a lot of athletes can be discouraged because they'll say, well, if I want to get my special athlete panel, I need to spend $5,000 on it because it's, you know, this is special to me, but if you're working with a good for a sport medicine team, you can get the same types of tests, the exact same types of tests working within your sport medicine team, um, for a fraction of the cost, and they can be just as beneficial to you for your performance. So that's just a, a kind of thing that's going on out there. And, and, um, and there's just a, a huge variation of pricing. And, and there's some athletes that have, have been approached to me that they want to get a specific special blood test. And a lot of times they're just the markers we've talked about, um, just marketed and packaged and um, being sold kind of at a higher price point. So what you're telling me is there are companies out there overcharging individuals for fancy marketing binders that have the same blood work. <laughs> Pretty much. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And, and it's your prerogative, you know, in the end of the day, I understand that, 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 you know, the, the marketing of, of stuff really does sell, you know, and so, and so, and sometimes it's nice to have um, the values kind of already interpreted for you and in a binder and it feels very professional. And I, and a lot of the, the results I've seen from these groups are beautiful. They, they really are um, well put together pieces of collateral, you know, collateral. Um, but at the same time, it's very cost prohibitive. So you have these young athletes that think they need this and it's specific and they're going to, you know, take out a, a loan to get their blood work. Um, but like I said, oftentimes it's just regular markers that you can get done with a good sport med team and, and it'll be a fraction of the cost. I can see someone going to the bank to make a loan and they're asking, what are you here for the loan for? Oh, I just want to get a blood analysis. And the person, <laughs> like, what? all right, Jen, this was fantastic information. Just awesome, awesome feedback, but you're not done yet because we have what's called our curveball round. This is where I'm going to ask you three questions. Nothing about today's topic, just some random things I wrote down while we were talking. Okay. So okay. first question is a staple. It's in every single person that I interviews curveball round because it's, it's something I love probably more than anything. And that's music. I know yes. we were talking offline about my love for music and I'm you know, trying to go to a concert tonight. But so if you had the ability to be the lead singer of any musical group band, whether it's today or in the past, who would that be? Oh, that is a big question. Oh, I, I think it would be the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah, them, because they just look like they have so much fun. And I love, I love, I love their music. It's just fun. And um, that or Pearl Jam, I was, I was kind of a, I grew up in that, in that phase of Nirvana and Pearl Jam and the grunge scene. And so that whole like genre was my world. So it yep. would probably be either like, yeah, Eddie Vedder or Anthony Kiedis. Those would be the, the people I'd want to transpose with. Although I don't know, think I could be as cool as them, but yes, yeah, well, this, is, this is fantasy land here. 
Well, I've, I've, I was a lead singer in a 90s alternative cover band for a couple of years, and I've, I've seen Pearl Jam twice at Wrigley, once at Fenway, and 13 other times. So you just, you named the love of like my band. Like, <laughs> so it was really, I was like, yes, she named Pearl Jam. Finally, someone said Pearl Jam. Yeah, and oh. apparently Eddie Vedder is a huge Bears fan, but I'd never, and people in the building like knew him and, and apparently he'd come to some games and I was like yep. hoping for that moment of meeting him. Yep. Um, it never happened. Yeah. Yeah, he he sings at Wrigley. He's a massive Cubs yes. fan. He's friends with Theo and um, my friends went to the show in Nashville last Saturday and he wore Walter Payton's jersey on stage. Nice. So um, yeah, it's, it's cool. He grew up in Evansville, which is not too far. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, question number two. If you only had... If, if the world said, hey, you have you can choose three foods or three meals for the rest of your life, oh, what boy. would it be? Okay. Uh, okay. So I have an obsession with making my own Napoleon, like Napolitana style pizza. I have like my own dough. I have a pizza oven. So I'm a pizza. I'm a like a traditional Italian pizza person. So pizza, but only my pizza, like not store-bought. <laughs> Jen, we have a funny name for my pizza shop that I have at home, but I, my pizza. Yes. That's one. Um, let's see. I've got three choices, three choices, two more left. Okay. Coffee. Uh, yep. That's going to be my other one. Cause that's pretty much what keeps me alive. Most days being the mother of a toddler. So pizza, <laughs> coffee, <laughs> and then this is going to be really random, but it just goes back to my Italian roots. Um, Growing up in a, in a very traditional Italian family, we actually ate raw fennel as a snack. And wow. um, that's something that like for me, it, I, it, it's one of those healthy snacks that I just, it brings me so much joy because it reminds me of my my family, you know, and growing up in, in my family and, and that raw fennel always being at my grandparents' house and my mom's house. And so it's a lot of like, you know, um, happy memories for me, bizarrely eating raw fennel. My husband thinks I'm crazy, but um that would be my third thing. That would be my comfort vegetable. Cause I got to get some veggies in with all the pizza slinging going on and coffee. Right. And then last question. So what would today's Jen tell young Jen? If you can go back and say one thing you would tell your younger self, what would that be? Oh boy. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Slow down and, and uh, look around. Yeah. I spent, I spent, because you and I come from the same vintage of time where when I first started, there was no full-time sport RD positions. In Canada, there was zero. And so I I, um, I, I ended up getting one of the very first full-time RD positions in Canada in 2006. And, um, and it was just, you had to really just, and that's part of why I moved to so many places is you had to just chase this career because the opportunities didn't exist as they do now. Um, and so I just did a lot of running around and working a lot. And uh, I think at one, when I was here with the US Olympic Committee, I was doing three jobs at once, traveling all around the world and not even like kind of taking stock of what I was doing, you know, sometimes. And so, yeah, it would be slow down and just look around for sure. You sound like my mom, cause she's like, son, are you ever gonna slow down? And I'm like, mom, you're 71. You still cut hair four days a week, go to horse shows. So it's like, I think we're a product of our environment. You know, if we see our parents working hard, we yep. still want to kind of model that. So this was fantastic. It's felt like a great conversation, phenomenal information. I know our listeners are probably like, wow, this is fantastic. So Jen, thank you for taking the time out of your yes. busy week to be with us and, and, and give us a lot of the information we need to know about biomarker testing. Awesome, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. No problem, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.